Hi, this is Group 6. I'm Danny Caldwell. I'm Jose Valdez. I'm Brian Rosales. And I'm Brandon Garibedian. The fire at the Triangle Shirtwaist Company in New York City, which killed 146 young immigrant workers, is one of the worst disasters since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. The victims of the tragedy are still celebrated as martyrs at the hands of industrial greed. The Triangle Waste Company in many ways was a typical sweat factory in the heart of Manhattan. In the Ash Building at the northern corner of Washington Square East in Washington Place. Low wages, really long hours, unsanitary and dangerous working conditions were the heart of sweatshops. Even though many people worked under one roof in the Ash Building owned by Max Blanc and Isaac Harris, the owner subcontracted most of the work to the individuals who hired the hands and pocketed a portion of the profits. Subcontractors could pay the workers whatever rates they wanted, often extremely low. The owners supposedly never knew the rates paid to the workers, nor did they know exactly how many workers were employed at their factory at any given point. Fires in sweatshops where lives were lost were not uncommon. One similar fire in Newark, New Jersey in November 1910 killed 25 workers. One month before the Joint Board began its investigations, New York City Fire Chief Edward Croker had testified before the State Investigating Committee on Corrupt Practices and Insurance Companies. When Chief Croker was asked about the limits of the fire department's ability to fight fires in taller buildings, Chief Croker replied, they were unable to fight fires above 85 feet, which is about seven stories. With many buildings in New York City being over seven stories tall, Chief Croker issued the emergency fire rules for the law factories in March 1911. The manufacturers organized in a, a campaign against the regulations as a quote-unquote interference in the conduct of commerce. The cost of the regulations to be implemented was thought to possibly make operations in New York so expensive that it would force them to move the factories to Philadelphia. The factory owners found sympathetic ears in the city government and Croker was shortly forced to withdraw his emergency order. Just a few days after the emergency fire rules were withdrawn by Chief Croker, a fire broke out on the eighth floor of the 10-story Ash Building where the Triangle Waste Company, with about 500 to 600 employees, took up cramped work areas on the top three floors. Shortly before the 4.45 p.m. quitting time, scraps of cloth clippings and wooden boxes stored under cutting tables are believed to have caught fire, possibly from a carelessly disposed cigarette. The men working the cutting tables ran to get buckets of water to extinguish the fire, the company's fire protection consists of 27 buckets distributed between the three floors. But before they could extinguish the fires, patterns and fabric hanging on the wires above the tables caught fire and the flames began to spread. By the time the fire was over, 146 of the employees had died. The survivors were left to live and relive those moments. The victims and their families, the people passing by who witnessed the desperate leaps from the ninth floor windows, and the city of New York will never be the same. Many of the Triangle factory workers were women, some as young as 14 years old. They were for the most part Italian, European, and Jewish immigrants who had recently come to the United States with their families to live a better life. Instead, they faced lives full of poverty and horrifying working conditions. As immigrants struggling with the new language and culture, they were easy victims for the factory owners. For these workers, speaking out could end with the loss of their needed jobs, which forced them to endure long hours and low pay. Some turned to labor unions to speak out for them. Many struggled alone. The Triangle Factory was a non-union shop, although some of its workers had joined the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union. The Triangle Fire tragically illustrated that fire inspections and precautions were not good at the time. Workers recounted how they had tried to open the ninth floor doors to the Washington Place stairs. They and many others afterwards believed they were deliberately locked. The owners had frequently locked the exit doors in the past, saying that workers would take breaks and would steal materials. The ninth floor fire escape in the Ash Building led nowhere and it crumbled under the weight of the factory workers trying to escape the fires. Others waited at the windows for the rescue workers, only to discover that the firefighters ladders were several stories too short and the water from the hoses could not reach the top floors. Many chose to jump to their death rather than to burn alive. Doctors examining each body for signs of life located survivors of the bodies piled up on the sidewalk and street. 
Officers gathered personal items including money, pay envelopes, papers, and jewelry for safekeeping and placed number tags on the victims before taking the dead to the 26th Street Pier where a temporary morgue was set up. In the weeks that followed, the grieving city identified the dead, sorted out the belongings, and mourned the dead realizing that if a few precautions had been put in place, hundreds of lives could have been saved. The International Ladies Garment Workers Union proposed an official day of mourning. The grief-stricken city gathered in churches, synagogues, and finally in the streets. Protesting began because of the lack of concern and the greed that had made it possible for so many people to die. The people demanded action that would safeguard sweatshop workers. Workers flocked to the unions to offer testimonies, support, and demanded the Triangle owners, Harris and Blanc, be brought to trial. The role that strong unions could have in helping prevent tragedies like this became clear. Workers organized in powerful unions would be more conscious of their rights and be better able to obtain safe working conditions. Eight months after the fire, an all-male jury acquitted Blanc and Harris, the factory owners of any wrongdoing which included manslaughter. The task of the jurors had been to determine whether the owners knew that the doors were locked at the time of the fire. Usually the only way out for the workers at the end of the day was through an opening on the Green Street side where all pocketbooks were inspected to prevent stealing. Workers testified that they were unable to open the doors to their only possible escape route, which was the stairs on the Washington Place exit, because the Green Street side stairs were completely engulfed by the fire. Defense attorney Max Stewart planted enough doubt in the jurors' minds to win a not guilty verdict. Grieving families and much of the public felt that justice had not been served. Twenty-three individual civil suits were brought against the owners of the Ash Building. Two years after the fire, Harris and Blanc settled. They paid $75 per life lost. Here are some of the laws that were in place at the time and the Triangle Waste Company's compliance with these laws. Article 6, Section 80 of the New York State Labor Laws states, All doors leading in or to any such factory shall be constructed as to open outwardly, where practicable, and shall not be locked, bolted, or fastened during working hours. The Triangle Shirtwaist Company did not comply. Whether Section 80 was violated was the key issue in the trial of Harris and Blanc, the owners. The case turned on whether the ninth floor staircase door on the Washington Place side was locked at the time of trial. The owner stated that they had a key strapped to the door handle so the workers could get out at any time, but they kept it locked on purpose towards the end of the shift because they didn't want people to steal or take breaks. Also, the owner stated that they did not place the doors opening outwardly because the staircase was too close and would get in the way. New York law states buildings with more than 2,500 square feet per floor but less than 5,000 square feet per floor are required to have two staircases. Each additional 5,000 square feet per floor are required to have an additional staircase. The Triangle Shirtwaist Company was in compliance with these regulations but just barely because they had 10,000 square feet per floor. New York law left the matter of fire escapes to the discretion of the building inspectors. The building inspector for the Ash Building insisted that the fire escape proposed for the building must lead down to something more substantial than a skylight. The architect's plan showed a rear fire escape leading to a skylight. Triangle Sherway's company compliance was the Ash Building architect promised the fire escape will lead to the yard and an additional balcony will be put in. In the final construction, the fire escape led to the second floor. During the fire, the escape collapsed under the weight of fleeing workers. New York law states buildings over 150 feet high must have metal trim, metal window frames, and stone or concrete floors. Buildings under 150 feet high must have no such requirements. The Triangle Shirtwaist Company compliance had the 10-story ash building was 135 feet high. If it had one more floor, it would have required none wood surfaces. In 1911, there were no New York laws that stated that sprinklers were required in any New York City building. The Ash Building had no sprinkler system. Are there any questions?